Good afternoon. Always nice to be back in Europe, especially nowadays. I'm going to start on a pretty somber note, and I hope it'll end up being a liberating reflection. But first, I have a requirement. I'm going to ask everyone to put their cell phones down, lock them, and if anybody cheats, I'm going to ask them to leave. Seriously. I want all the photographers to stay in the back. We're going to have a nice, reflective classroom setting here, all right? Everybody in the back. All right, so here's where we stand. GDP has been growing at a slower rate all over the world for quite a time now. And the reason this is happening is productivity has been declining all over the world for the last two decades. The result is we have a lot of high structural unemployment, especially among the millennial generation still trying to find a place, a secure place, in a 21st century workforce. Our economists are projecting 20 more years of low performance in the global economy. Let's do the numbers. We are now 200 years into the Industrial Revolution, and here's where we stand today. Arguably, half the human race, most of us in the West, are far better off than our ancestors were before we began this experiment in history, correct? It's also fair to say, however, that 45% of the human race this afternoon, making $4 or less, a day, which is the marginal poverty level, are really no better off than their ancestors were, and we could make a case worse off. While half the human race has done better, the other half of the human race, marginal at best, the very wealthy, have done very well. This afternoon, the eight richest people in the world, we could put them in this role, eight people. Those eight individuals, their combined wealth, now equals the accumulated wealth of one-half the human beings living on Earth. That is three and a half billion people. There's something so dysfunctional about the way the human family is organizing our economic relationships on this planet. But now we have a much more profound crisis. We are 200 years into the Industrial Revolution, and that revolution sits on top of the fossil fuel civilization. Let us be clear. It's all about fossil fuels. 200 years ago, we began to exhume the bodies of life that existed in a burial ground from 300 million years ago, the Carboniferous era. Those bodies were transformed into oil, coal, and gas. And we exhumed them, and we made an entire civilization out of them. Our pesticides, our fertilizers, our construction materials, our pharmaceutical products, our food additives and preservatives, our packaging, our power, our transport, our heat, our light, it's endless. The entire civilization is based on digging up those burial grounds. And now we have exhumed them and we put so much CO2 into the atmosphere from using these fossil fuels that we are now in real time climate change. No longer a theory, no longer looming on the horizon. It's here, and it is taking its vengeance. Let me explain what climate change does, because all of us think we know what it does, but if we just spent one minute to explain it, the whole world would be justifiably terrified, alarmed, and with only one mission, not many priorities, only one, to save the planet, to save our fellow species, to save ourselves. Climate change changes the water cycles of the Earth. That's what this is all about. We are the watery planet. Our ecosystems have developed and evolved over millions of years based on the hydrological cycle that traverses the clouds and bathes our biomes and ecosystems and lets life flourish. Here's the rub. For every one degree that the temperature goes up on this planet, from global warming emissions, all those CO2 molecules and methane and nitrous oxide, they're blocking that heat from getting off the planet. So when every one degree that temperature goes up, the atmosphere is sucking up 7% more precipitation from the ground. The heat is forcing the precipitation into the clouds more quickly. 
we're getting more concentrated precipitation in the clouds and dramatic, extreme, unpredictable, exponential water events. Polar vortex last winter, 70, 80 below zero in the north and blockbuster winter snows, that's the new abnormal. Then it's followed in every season by spring floods. In my country, we had flooding every year now across the entire Mississippi and Missouri basin from Minnesota to the Gulf of Mexico. Our farmers are flooded out. They had to be totally subsidized. The crops didn't come in last year. And what you're not hearing is they are literally exiting small towns and evacuating them forever. There's no flood insurance and they're living with relatives in other parts of the country in real time. Not reported. Then after the spring floods, we have the summer droughts and wildfires and they go all the way into the fall. California was on fire again. All of the Los Angeles area on fire. We had to shut down the entire power grid of Northern California about a month and a half ago for fear the entire state would burn down. It didn't, but now Australia is burning down this afternoon in real time an entire continent. Then after the summer droughts and wildfires, we get the hurricane season. We had four category three, four hurricanes hit our Gulf Coast beginning in August, devastating islands and devastating our coastal area. Every region of the world is facing this. This is not going to get better. It's going to become more frequent. We are in a new period of history. The nice, comfortable Holocene of the last 11,000 years that gave us agriculture and the Industrial Revolution is gone. So let me share this with you. Our ecosystems cannot catch up to this runaway water cycle. They're collapsing, and now our scientists tell us we are in the sixth extinction. Doesn't even make the headlines. No one even knows. This is the most important single story we've ever heard, and we're oblivious. There have been five extinctions on this planet over 450 million years, well before humans were here. Massive die-out, very quick, 10 million years to get some new life back. We're in the sixth extinction, and if you're a young millennial about to raise a family, or if you're a parent or grandparent, please listen to this. Our scientists are chronicling the extinction, and they say we may lose up to half the species that currently inhabit this Earth in the next eight decades. There are toddlers today who will be my age then. These species have been here for millions of years. We'll never see them, we'll never hear them, and what they do affects everything else on this Earth. So, our UN panel on climate change, the scientists last year said we are at one degree Celsius. If we go up past one and a half degrees Celsius, that water cycle starts to give us a cascading series of events. The snows, the floods, the summer droughts, the wildfires, the hurricanes, beyond anything we can fathom and nothing in our playbook shows us how to address this. And they said we have 12 years, now 11 years left, to completely transform the civilization to keep it at one five or less. So what do we do? We need a new economic vision for the world. It needs to be compelling. We need a game plan to execute it. It needs to be quick. And we have to be off, not, not near, off a carbon-based civilization by 2040, not 2050. So we need to step back and ask this question. How do the great economic paradigm shifts in history occur? If we know how they occur, this young generation in this room will get a roadmap and a compass to let us chart a new journey very, very quickly. There have been seven, at least seven major economic paradigm shifts in history. They're very, very interesting from an ecological point of view, from an anthropological point of view as well. And that is, at a certain period of time across a civilization, and it's often serendipitous, Three defining technologies emerge and converge to create an infrastructure that fundamentally transforms the way a society manages, powers, and moves its economic life, its social life, and governance. And when that happens, it changes our habitats, it changes our temporal spatial orientation, it allows larger collectivities of human beings to come together in more complex relationships over time and space, these technology infrastructure revolutions change our governance and our economic models. 
What are these technologies? Number one, new communication revolutions that allow more complex societies to com communicate with each other beyond shouting distance. Number two, new sources of energy to allow a large collectivities to come together in complex relationships and have the power and energy to do that. Number three, new modes of mobility and logistics so we can move social and economic life with larger collectivities and more complex relationships. When communication revolutions converge with new energy regimes, new modes of mobility and logistics fundamentally changes the way we manage power and move the economy and society and life. It changes our temporal spatial orientation and it changes our habitats, the way we live and where we live and work. If this sounds vaguely familiar to you, even though what I've said is not in any textbook anywhere in the world, how many of you took high school biology? Now you should know. Every organism has to have a means to communicate. Every organism has to have a source of energy to maintain itself in non-equilibrium and not die. Every organism has to have some motility and mobility in order to traverse its lifespan. And every organism has to have a semi-permeable membrane, a habitat, a skin, a shell that allows it to orchestrate its inside against the outside circannual, lunar, and circadian rhythms of the planet. Our infrastructures, and you're smiling because you get it, are simply an extension of what every organism has to do so we can create a social prosthesis so a whole group of people, large collectivities, can come together over time and space. That's why they're fundamental. We tend to think infrastructure just bridges and roads. No, this is what it is. We tend to think economic systems create infrastructures and governments create infrastructures. No, the new technologies that come together create the framework and determine the kind of economic models you'll use to manage them, and for government, the kind of oversight you need to lay them out and maintain them. I'm going to give you two quick examples. First Industrial Revolution, Britain, 19th century. Second Industrial Revolution, US, 20th century. The Brits have a convergence. They went from the German manual print press, slow, steam power printing, quick. They could mass produce communications for something called textbooks for public schools for universal education, otherwise we'd never had it, and magazines, newspapers, journals, catalogs, very cheap. Then the Brits lay out a telegraph system across the British Isles, 19th century. Steam power printing in the telegraph converged with a new source of energy, coal from the hinterlands, harvested by that same steam engine they used for communication. Then they put the steam engine on rails, locomotives, national transport. That changed our built environment. We had the first dense urban industrial cities to live and work because you had hub-to-hub -hub rail traffic. And it took us from local markets to national markets. With national markets, you needed nation states to govern them. And it gave us a new economic model called shareholder capitalism. There was no monarchy that could ever afford to finance the extraction and movement of fossil fuels or railroads. Second Industrial Revolution in the United States, 20th century, communication, energy, mobility, change in our habitats. The telephone was a really big deal. We could, could conceive of the internet before it happened, but to conceive of the telephone before it happened, impossible. Later, radio and television. Those communication mediums in the 20th century in the US converged with a new source of energy. The Texas oil wells came in. Then Henry Ford put everybody in the internal combustion engine for mobility and logistics. That changed our built environment from dense urban living and working spaces to suburban build out. That took us from national markets to globalization with container ships and jet travel. And that took us to giant vertically integrated global companies to manage our day-to-day -day life. Today we have 500 global companies, they're all vertically integrated because the fossil fuel civilization requires massive vertical integration to uh, get your economies of scale. Those 500 companies are accountable for one third of the GDP of the world. They only have 67 million employees out of a workforce of three and a half billion, it should tell you something. I know because I taught many of them in the advanced management program at Wharton in our CEO program for a long, long time. That's where we stand. 
What's happened is this, that second industrial revolution took us through the 20th century, the whole world, and it peaked in July 2008. And that's when Brent crude oil that month hit $147 a barrel on the world markets and the whole economy shut down. July 2008 was the earthquake and the beginning of the end game for the fossil fuel civilization. The collapse of the financial market and the subprime 60 days later was an aftershock because it was a fictional economy because everything's based on fossil fuels, everything. So when the price of fossil fuels goes over to 80 a barrel, all the other prices go up. At about 110 a barrel, purchasing power slows down. And wherever we have fossil fuels, with two exceptions, we have authoritarian or failed states. The two exceptions, unfortunately, are the United States of America, the number one fossil fuel power, and, although they hide behind the screen, Canada, number four. Is there anyone in this room that thinks we are in the sunrise or even the crest or the plateau of the fossil fuel civilization? Then why are our oil and fossil fuel companies desperately building out new gas-fired power plants, coal-fired power plants, and pipelines? What do they tell their children when they come home? We'll get back to that in a moment. So where do we go from here? I'm going to share an anecdote with you. When Angela Merkel became Chancellor of Germany, she asked me to come to Berlin in the first few weeks of her government to help her address the question of how do we grow the German economy, create jobs. The first thing I asked the new chancellor, I said, Madam Chancellor, how do you grow the German economy when your businesses are plugged into a second industrial revolution infrastructure of centralized telecommunications, fossil fuel nuclear power, internal combustion, road, rail, water, and air transport, and we know thermodynamically that we reached the ultimate aggregate efficiency on that platform in every industrial country in the last 20 years. It came in around 17, 18, to 20 percent aggregate efficiency globally. That's the ratio of useful to potential work in every economic conversion. So I said to her, you can have market reform, labor reform, fiscal reform. You can try to stimulate all sorts of startup companies here. But if they're plugged into a second industrial revolution infrastructure, centralized telecommunication, fossil fuel, nuclear power, internal combustion, transport, you can't get any more performance. It's the infrastructure they plug into that gives you the performance. So on that first day, we talked about a third industrial revolution, a emerging convergence of three great technologies that will allow us to quickly exit the fossil fuel civilization, radically reduce the carbon footprint, radically reduce our marginal cost, radically increase our aggregate efficiencies, and hopefully, it's a razor-thin path now, we might be able maybe to do this in 20 years, maybe. But all the stars have to align, and we have to have a whole generation with one mission in place in this room. This third industrial revolution is the digital revolution. There is no fourth industrial revolution. AI, robotics, genetics, it all relies on digital technology, algorithm, governments. It's all part of it. Here's what it is. We are 29 years into the World Wide Web. We have 4.5 billion people connected in communication. Pretty soon, everybody. Korea and, Japan, and China and Korea now have a smartphone for $25 with more computing power than sent our astronauts to the moon. There are people in the Amazon villages right now with that smartphone. That's amazing. Now this digitized communication internet is just now beginning to converge with a digitized renewable energy internet. We have millions of small players, co-ops, small SMEs, neighborhood associations, even big companies. They are producing their own solar and wind and what they're not using on site. They're sending it back on an increasingly digitized renewable energy internet and soon a high power uh, direct current internet and they're sharing energy with each other using the same data, the same analytics and algorithms we use to share news, knowledge, and entertainment on the communication internet. They're converging. Now these two internets are converging with a third internet, a mobility and logistics internet, all digitized. And that internet's made up of electric and fuel cell vehicles and shared services. Those vehicles uh, are using solar and wind from the energy internet. And those vehicles will be autonomous on road, rail, water, inland, and drones in the next 10 years. And they'll be operated by the same algorithms, data algorithms, and analytics we use to manage our energy on the energy internet across continents, 
and across the world, and the communication internet. These three internets, communication internet, energy internet, mobility internet, ride on top of a platform called the Internet of Things. In the Internet of Things, we're putting sensors across the entire world, in the environment, in the agricultural fields, but mainly in the buildings, the habitats. So remember I said the first industrial revolution, urban habitats, the second, suburban, the third, every building in the world is going to become a node. It's already starting. They're no longer passive, they're open nodes. They'll have to be deeply retrofitted for resilience. That's going to be the big challenge on climate change. Every node building becomes an edge data center. How many know edge data centers? This is where we're heading. Every, bu every building will become an edge data center so you can control your own data. These giant vertically integrated companies like uh, Facebook and Amazon and whatever, they took a second industrial revolution business model and tried to graft it onto a third industrial revolution Internet of Things. It doesn't work. The first and second industrial revolutions were designed to be centralized, top-down, proprietary, and you had to vertically integrate to create economies of scale. The Russians had to do it the same way we did it. But all of you in this digital universe here in this room, you know, you grew up as digital natives, the third industrial revolution likes to be distributed. That's how Berner Lee set it up. It works best if it's open and transparent so you can get the network effect. If everybody gains, everybody gains. It's not a zero-sum game and you want to laterally scale. With edge data centers, you're going to laterally scale. Because it means that we're developing so much data with this Internet of Things and by 2030 we're all going to have sensors all over the world. And what I'm telling you here this afternoon is the big vertically integrated organizations, they can't handle all this data. There is no way it will not happen even if there's a hundred of them. We're going to have edge data centers all over the world. Everywhere we are, it's already starting. And they can't handle it with the cloud because of the latency factor. This is the problem, the latency factor. If you have an autonomous vehicle and you're about to crash, you're going to send that data to the cloud and wait for it to come back? Good luck. You're going to have to have edge data centers blockchained in platforms that are very fluid to move this along. We're going to go to fog computing. This is a shift from globalization to glocalization. It's already happening around the world. And so now regions and SMEs and high-tech companies like in this room, you can engage globally now, locally, with very low fixed cost and very low marginal cost with this technology and bypass some of those global Fortune 500 companies and the nation states and all the institutions that were intermediaries, right? It's happening all over the world. This is a dramatic shift. It doesn't mean that global companies will all disappear. Some will make the transformation. They will end up being aggregators of networks working with very high-tech SMEs who will do most of the heavy lifting. So, by 2030, we're connecting now these paradigm shifts in history. Oftentimes, you have paradigm shifts and then they collapse because there's an entry bill. They destroy the environment. There's nothing to replace them. We have dark periods in history, but nonetheless, there's an evolutionary history where we, for some reason, human beings as social creatures are determined with these infrastructures to build more advanced, sophisticated infrastructure to bring larger numbers of people together in collective holes as a social organism to engage in life. That seems to be what we're about. So, we are heading to globalization. What does this mean for where we want to go from here? Let's say you're an SME here in Germany. You can go up on this Internet of Things infrastructure already, and if it stays open and network neutral, you have a lot of data coming through, right? You can take the data you care about in your SME and mine it with your own analytics. Create your own algorithms and apps so you can dramatically increase your aggregate efficiency at every conversion on your value chain, your logistics, your production, your distribution, your recycling. Dramatically plunge your carbon footprint because you're getting more out of less of the earth in a circular economy, and you plunge your fixed and marginal cost. Some of the marginal cost is already getting so low that it's forcing a metamorphous change of capitalism itself. This is coming from the inside. Let me explain. In economics, we always teach our students that the optimum market is where you sell at marginal cost. You want to put out cheap products, cheap services, get over market share, win over market share, bring some profits back to the investors, correct? It's, that's the optimum market. It's just we didn't anticipate a digital revolution that could be so powerful in its aggregate efficiency 
taking us from 20% aggregate efficiency to 60%. Those are our studies with our global team. So the digital technology allows the marginal cost to really plunge and then your profit margins shrink. This is forcing a shift in the capitalist business model from the inside. Market capitalism is too slow for the digital revolution you are creating in this room. Markets are transactional. You have a seller, a buyer, they come together, they alienate the good or service, and then it's over. And in between, you have marketing, advertising costs, warehouses, you have to pay your employees, insurance, etc. Too slow with low marginal cost. So we're going to have to move from transactions in markets to flows in networks. We're going to move from ownership to access, from sellers and buyers to providers and users. We're going to move from productivity to regenerativity, from GDP to quality of life indicators, from externality to circularity, and it's this digital interconnectivity that allows us to do every one of these things in real time. When the marginal costs become low, the only way you create, keep your margins, you can blockchain them or some other way, the only way you keep those margins is by 24-7 operation of traffic and provider user networks. There's no downtime. You follow me? And in, in a while, I'll introduce the model that we introduced in Europe that's been taken by the electric utility companies, mobility and transport, uh, and I will give you examples from across the major industries. Some of the marginal cost already is getting so low, it is actually heading to near zero in some goods and services. And it's given rise to the sharing economy. Now, the sharing economy, some of it is being absorbed by the Ubers, if you will. Uh, but some of it is like Wikipedia, which is the fifth largest website, and we're constructing the entire knowledge of the world, and it's free, and it's not in the GDP. <laughs> or we're taking massive open online college courses and getting credit, not in the GDP. So what's happened now is we're in a hybrid economic system. Part of it would be going to provider user networks. Some of it is going to go to the sharing economy. And be clear, the sharing economy is the first new economic system to enter the world stage since capitalism in the 18th century and socialism in the 19th century. It's of a different ilk. And capitalism is metamorphosing outside of itself to something else we haven't defined yet in order to stay ahead of the game or in stay in the game. So, this is kind of the framework, and then where do we go from here? The three major sectors that make up our second industrial revolution infrastructure are all decoupling. ICT, telecom, and internet, all of them are getting out of fossil fuels and nuclear power. Amazon, Facebook, Google, they are either totally out with secure data centers, which is most of the electricity they use, solar and wind, paid back in a few years, it's cheaper than, and it's plunging on the cost. I think Microsoft announced their plan yesterday to be out in a year or two. They're all getting off. Intel, Cisco, Microsoft, Google, all of them, they're gone. That's the communication internet. And now the energy internet. So they're now decoupling, and let me explain what happened in Germany, because I work with Sigmar Gabriel and the folks there on this transition. They didn't see this coming in electricity. There is a rule of thumb that's not well known, even by Joseph Schumpeter, on how disruptions really occur. And so when solar and wind in Germany were only 4 or 5% of the grid, who cared, you know? What they didn't realize, it wasn't so important that they were only 4 or 5%. What's important is how fast the in challenger is coming into the market and how it slows down the incumbent. When solar and wind got to 14% of the electricity in the German grid and then across Europe, it was over because the investment community realized that fossil fuel nuclears were slowing down and they were going to be in stranded assets. The U.S. reaches 14% solar and wind in 2023, inflection. Globally, we reach it in 2028. This is where we're headed. And now, this is what you don't know. Maybe you do know. Solar and wind have been on an exponential curve like computers. Now, when I was a kid, there were no computers. The first computer was at my university, University of Pennsylvania. And the chairman of IBM at the time said, we'll need five computers. Five is what we'll need. They're too expensive. 
They didn't anticipate the Intel engineers in the 1970s doubling the capacity on the chips, now smartphone $25. We've had the same curve with solar and wind and they all ignored it. So it used to cost $78, fixed cost one watt in the late 70s. It's 43 cents this afternoon. 35 cents in 18 months from now. We have power and utility companies buying long-term contracts right now this year for five cents, four cents, three cents, two and a half cents a kilowatt hour because they know the curve in 20 years. And here's what you don't know. I spend time every week with the financial community, the banking community, insurance industry. Panic. It's called stranded assets. And our Citigroup, to their credit, understood what was happening here back around 2015 and they said, we may have the biggest bubble in history, $100 trillion in stranded assets across the fossil fuel industry. But what they didn't see is in 2019, the levelized cost of solar and wind dipped below natural gas and is still plunging and the marginal cost is zero. The sun and the wind have never invoiced us. Uranium, coal, coal oil, gas, big price. It's over. This is the market speaking, and it's because the EU put in the 2020 formula. And then China, we worked in China, moved those subsidies down, and now the market is speaking. It's more powerful than the industry. So fossil fuel stranded assets, we're talking about all the exploration rights that will never be amortized over 30 years, all of the fossil fuels that will stay under the ocean floor and the ground because they'll never be amortized out, the pipelines that will be abandoned, the petrochemical refineries that we will not use, the gas-fired power plants they're still putting in, we do not need them for backup for solar and wind anymore. We have algorithm governance that can actually deal with peak and base loads today and storage batteries and fuel cells. And they're still putting gas-fired power plants online. Do you know that? And coal-fired power plants. And the UN announced in Madrid on the production gap that they're still putting this in even knowing they're stranded. And a report, another report came out at the UN saying that in the next five years, the proposed or already being deployed new projects in the next five years takes us way over 1.5, and it makes no difference. Anything else we do if that happens. We need, as, uh, we need a freeze. We had a nuclear freeze and a non-proliferation treaty for nuclear in the 80s. We need an immediate freeze on any further coal, oil, and gas, and just transitions to help the workers out, because they shouldn't be the victims of this. And we need a non-proliferation treaty. And guess what? 85% of all these new plants coming online in the next five years, you know where they're coming from? Texas, New Mexico, Alberta, and British Columbia. EU has to step forward here, because all of our good works will mean nothing. But here's where we stand at this point. With these stranded assets, we have $11 trillion that have exited this industry in the last four years. Does that sound impressive? $11 trillion. And they're being led by public pension funds. There is panic. And the reason is, you should know that uh, Karl Marx could never anticipated the fact that the workers are actually the major capitalists in the world today through their pension funds. These are the deferred savings of workers that are then invested for them for their retirement. So the public pension funds started to panic a couple of years ago because they saw the coal industry going bankrupt in the U.S. because of natural gas and now solar and wind. All the workers lost their pension, gone. And so the public pension funds, of all the public employees that were getting out, London's gotten out, New York just got out. It's all over the world. There's maybe 50, 60 major cities they've gotten out in the last two years. And now the private pension funds, the family funds, the sovereign funds. So $11 trillion have exited this industry, and they're desperate to engage and invest with green banks and green bonds in a third industrial revolution that can be deployed quickly because the technology is digital. It's all here, which will give all of you a lot of work to do in this room to lay out the infrastructure, create the new businesses and opportunities and performance, and move to a post-carbon economy. We don't even need new taxes. There's trillions in the private sector wanting to invest in low-interest bonds to get secure investments over 20 years. Here's the problem. We have 9,000 cities that signed up for the Global Covenant of Mayors. And uh, the Secretariat's with us in Brussels. Meryl Sefcovich was the head of that. It's just changed. 
And if you talk to these 9,000 mayors and you go to their cities, they will show you their 10 beautiful, gleaming electric buses. You'll take a photo. Then they'll show you their 20 lead buildings, and you'll take a photo. Then they'll show you their bike paths and the cool apps that connect them to the trams. They're all pilots. The only deployed, major-scaled infrastructure project in all of Europe, believe it or not, is redoing the Victorian sewer system in London. So, the market is speaking, trillions of dollars have exited, and more are coming. They're desperate to invest in what's holding us up. The European Investment Bank did a study, and they went out and they asked all the municipalities around Europe, why are you not investing in infrastructure? You know the reason they gave? They said, we can't do it because of the stability compact. And that is, we can only spend up to 3% uh, deficit to our budgets, and over 60% is the line in terms of our debt to GDP. So we can't do it. What we need now is a very careful but quick conversation, and here's what I would suggest, and that we should make a one-only time frame that all investments that go just to this infrastructure, nothing else, just lock it out, this infrastructure revolution that we need to do, it's an exception and we invest. And we put a time limit of 20 years, which is the rollout of this infrastructure, and then it's gone and back to the normal, even within the infrastructure. We know that for every euro we invest in infrastructure, we get two to three euros back in GDP. It will be paid back. It always is. There is no loss. If we don't do this, we're not going to make it because the monies won't be there, and we're not going to tax everybody in Europe for this. So having said that, the key question now is, how do we actually deploy this revolution? In my country, all the candidates for Democratic candidates for the president, God bless them, I love most of them, I know some of them, they misunderstand the nature of this Green New Deal. It is not going to be like the New Deal of FDR in 1932, because then we had centralized Second Industrial Revolution infrastructure, so you needed centralized government to create the jobs, the employment, put in the dams, the TVA, the electricity. But this Third Industrial Revolution infrastructure is distributed. Everyone's in the infrastructure. You have a home if you have a business, if you have a solar panel, a charging station, electric vehicle for storage, everyone's in this. And what I think our presidential candidates have not understood is that in my country, 93% of the infrastructure is owned by the states. Can you imagine? No one's mentioned this. So they have all these federal programs which are just siloed projects. No narrative that I've explained to you today. Just a siloed project here, a siloed project. We're going to put a trillion here, a billion there. They're missing the narrative, which is this digital revolution you're putting together, which is what we create this Green Deal about. And they're missing the fact that 75% of the infrastructure Improvements are made by the state, and they own 93%. The federal governments, and this is true in the EU, so I'll go to the EU. The EU member states will set the codes, the regulations, the standards, the incentives, the penalties, and the mandates. The member states in the EU and the EU Commission, but it'll be up to the 350 regions. They control, the, they own the infrastructure mostly. They got to build this out. Now, this is a good thing because we have a principle in the EU Constitution which has been ignored since the Maastricht Treaty. It's called the subsidiarity principle. How many know this? This is our centerpiece of Europe, but it's been in theory, not in practice, now to practice. All power not delegated by the member states to the EU, it stays in the regions because that's where people live their lives. We're going to have to deploy this third industrial digital revolution in all 350 regions. So I joined with Meryl Sefcovich, who was the vice president for the Energy Union. Now he's the vice president for Foresight and the new commission. We uh, joined with the president of the Committee of the Regions in 2017. We announced Smart Europe. You have today this pamphlet. The European Investment Bank asked me to write this essay. They're distributing it across Europe in September. This is Smart Europe. This is for the digital younger generation. You're going to build this out in this room in Germany around Europe. This is your mission. Pretty big responsibility. So how do we do this? How do you get regions to do this? Ursula van der Leyen is, I think, terrific. And the reason I believe that she's going to help guide us here is when she announced the Green Deal, she said, be clear here, I have seven children. 
we're going to do this. And so there's an ambitious effort at the Commission level and in the European Parliament and all the five major political parties of Europe. I'm going back to Brussels this week with everybody. We want to do this, but we've got to have the money and we've got to move the deployment. And the amount of money, while the ambition is bold, 2050 is too late. We're going to have to do it by 2040. And secondly, the money that's being put out is too little. We need to help Ursula von der Leyen because she's going to be our leader here and the Parliament, the European Parliament, and our member states. How do we set up regions so they can do this? My global group has been fortunate to scale up five regions around the world, and we made some mistakes. So I'm going to share with you the mistakes and then tell you where we think we are. We have three regions now that are deploying what we call peer assemblies. That's the Haute de France, the industrial region of France, the steel auto region of France, the home of Macron and Marie Le Pen. We've been six years in that region. We're in the 23 cities of Rotterdam to The Hague, the petrochemical industry, and we're in Luxembourg of financial capital. And what, here's what we did. So the president of Haute de France came to us years ago, 2011, it was then, it was just North Calais, and he said, will you do a plan with, for us? And I said, absolutely not. You'll sit on a shelf, some minister will do a pilot, and we're going to extinction. I'm too old, we won't do this. I really said, we won't do it. He was shocked because he likes anything, so any company would like to do anything. I said, however, if you go back to the region, you get a hold of every mayor across every political party and you ask them this question. If this were the second industrial revolution, the first industrial revolution, one political party wanted it, would the other party say, no, we decided we don't want it? Of course not. Then you line up all the chambers of commerce, all the labor unions, all the universities and research institutes, then you come back to me. I didn't think he'd come back. They normally don't. He came back tenacious guy. He said, we've lined them all up, and I said, we still won't do it. He said, you're kidding. And all I said, I'm not kidding. But if you do this, I want you to put together a peer assembly, not a focus group, not a stakeholder group. Those are BS. All right? I want a peer assembly with thousands of people giving input on the web and elsewhere with meetings. Then I want you to put 300 people in this peer assembly, like a grand jury, for a year, outside of the regular jobs, no pay. Uh, and you pick them because the government leads out of all the sectors, all the industries, all the cohorts and the generations. And then we will bring the best people in France and around the world to work with you, and you'll create this third industrial revolution infrastructure based on the architecture, digital communication combined with digital energy, digital mobility, IoT, and you'll customize to your region. They did it. And so did Rotterdam to The Hague, and so did Luxembourg. And now Haute de France is in its sixth year, 1,200 projects, thousands of people employed, high-tech parks. They're moving on the retrofitting and all of it. Now they want to deploy. They have billions of dollars in deployment. They want to go forward, and we've got to get the money. If Haute de France could do this, every region in Europe can do this. And I remember what Chancellor Merkel said at the end of the first meeting. She said, Mr. Rifkin, I like this distributed third industrial revolution for Germany. And I said, why? And she said, you need to understand our governance here. We are a federal republic. Our 16 regions control their economic destiny, and our federal government creates the code, the regulations, the standards, the alignment, the mandates. This can be done. But for those of peer assemblies, now, Van, uh, President Van der Leyen has said she wants citizens' meetings. It, we don't need just citizens' meetings. I'm glad she's doing it to get their input. We actually need to lay out these peer assemblies in all 350 regions and then they have to work with their member states and with the EU and bring the best talent in Europe, including the entire digital native uh, technology expertise in this room, to bear. Final thing on this. The money's there, the market speaking. The fossil fuel complex will probably collapse. Transport and logistics, the last sector. I mentioned energy is going to be in the inflection point by 2028. Right now, only 2% of our vehicles are electric vehicles. But the studies in the book, the, the book, uh, Green New Deal book, we, these are all studies in the industry from the last 18 months, not my studies. Internal reports, banking, finance, all the sectors. These are their studies. So the studies from inside transport industry says we will have uh, EVs competitive with internal combustion engine, no subsidy 2023. They'll be cheaper in 2026. 
We'll have 20% of EVs on the road globally 2028. That's the inflection point. Why is this important? Volkswagen understands, and I was with another car company yesterday in Germany, I won't name it, but they understand this. Volkswagen's just announced in June, biggest car company in the world, they're going to put out the last internal combustion platform, I think it's in 26, 28, and they're devoting 80 billion euros, that's one company, to complete electrification of the fleet, and they expect to have 22 million vehicles all connected to this digital revolution out there in 2028, and they've joined with Bechtel to put in 35,000 charging stations, and all of this will have to be connected in a digital infrastructure across Europe. We consume 93 million barrels of oil a day in the world. Two-thirds of it goes to transport. 2028, 29, it's going to be over. Our big problem is not that the fossil fuel civilization is collapsing. It is, the market speaking. Not stranded assets. There are trillions. The biggest issue now is governance. It's the political will at the local and national level that's not up to the game to do these peer assemblies and to begin to address the question of how to map out and deploy in every region. This gets me to the millennials and Gen Zs. So these are the two generations who are stuck at this critical moment in history in extinction. And I appreciated the protests when they started, and I thought, that's good, they're on the streets, they're putting pressure on, but I didn't quite get what this was about until I met a few uh, Extinction Rebellion young people in Italy, and it dawned on me, because I know we've had protests through history. I'm an activist, I protested for many years on all sorts of issues. We've had tribal blood wars and, and uh, ideological wars, theological wars, all sorts of grievance wars. We've had protests over many things. This is different. What happened here is on three strikes in the last year, millions of Gen Zs walked out of their classroom in 130 nations, joined by their older brothers and sisters who were in office as millennials. They walked out in 130 nations, millions of them, and this was the first planetary revolt of two generations crossing all borders in all of history. This is the first time two cohorts across the world and across all the language and all the color boundaries and the ideological boundaries and the religious boundaries has started to see themselves as an endangered species. First time. And this is the first time two generations globally have began to perceive of their fellow creatures as part of their evolutionary family. And if they're endangered, we're endangered. And this is the first generation that's began to see the biosphere as our indivisible community. We are eliminating the other. That doesn't mean all the other boundaries are going to disappear, but we're moving from a geopolitical world to capture and control everything with fossil fuels to a biosphere world where you have to share the sun, share the wind, share the Earth's spheres, and understand that we're only one agency among all the agencies that govern this planet. This is biosphere consciousness. This gives me a, a, some guarded hope, but here's what I say to those young people. Keep the protests up in the streets, and you keep that pressure up nonviolent, but that's not all you're going to do. You have to now get engaged in the political life of this planet tomorrow morning. AOC, the young congresswoman, the youngest one in congressional history, 28. The new prime minister of Finland, she's 35. We need an entire generation today to push out the older generation that's in political office, push out the parties if you have to. It's not that they're of ill will. They can't handle this. It's not on their watch. And when young people come to their city council, their mayor, the president of the region, and they say, we have an emergency, climate emergency, we want a Green New Deal, you know what answer they get? We agree with you. It's a priority. It's one of our key priorities. And then the, the young people say, it's one of our key priorities. Can you tell me what are the other priorities you're balancing this against when we're in extinction? Tell us what are the other priorities. All the other priorities fold in to making a paradigm shift in our economy and society. They got to sweep them out. They got to change the parties. We have to move to peer governance. And finally, the reason we have to do this, if any of you have been in a climate disaster, a hurricane or a fire, when these happen, no government can handle it. It's too big. The whole city comes out. The neighborhoods, uh, the university students, the NGOs, the small businesses, everyone on deck. 
And what we're learning now is climate disasters are now coming as soon as you try to restore from the last disaster, you'll get the next one with the hurricanes and the fires, et cetera. So there's these ad hoc forms of governance that have been emerging between communities and government to deal with disasters and renovation, and then the next one happens, so we now need to formalize them. We will never be able to address climate change and steward our 19 kilometers of biosphere in each community without everybody taking a, a, a moment, like a jury, and for a year being part of their community to steward it forward. These peer assemblies have to be ongoing. This is a new form of governance. This is a subsidiarity principle of the European Constitution in practice. This will have to happen all over the world. Last thought. I came here this afternoon because we've got the digital revolution in this room, right here. If not you, who? So I'm hoping that after these sessions are over, when you go back to your communities, think about what role you can play in this digital revolution to move this forward. We're beyond the idea of just creating some little niche that can give us some little business. What we need to think about is the business opportunities that will allow us and allow the digital community to begin becoming a partner and moving us toward this infrastructure transformation in this digital third industrial revolution IoT world. Yes, we're going to have to deal with the dark net. We're going to have to deal with network neutrality. We're going to have to deal with data security. We're going to have to deal with all of that, and we're going to do it by building redundancy into the system so if there's a breakdown, a climate event, a terrorist attack, we can decentralize, go on our mini-grids, and we're not going to privatize this infrastructure either. When private companies privatize infrastructure, they strip the assets. And if you have a sewer system that's gogged because of climate change or a toll road or a private prison, they do not try to improve them if it's against the bottom line. On the other hand, private industry has all the expertise, correct? So what we want to do is keep those infrastructures in your communities, in your neighborhoods as commons that you can work with as platforms. And then we're going to do energy service companies. They've been around for 40 years. They're a model as we transition capitalism. Schneider, uh, Johnson Train, big companies are doing this. With an ESCO, we issue green bonds with green banks here in Germany. Those bonds are purchased. The ESCOs get the financing, and they're responsible for putting in the entire infrastructure. It's their responsibility. This is a provider-user network. They get paid back by the energy savings, by the efficiencies, by the circularity that they put in. And as they get paid back, this through performance contracting, but guess what? The infrastructure always belongs to you as a homeowner, a small business. These are provider-user networks, not seller-buyer markets. The provider secures those gains, you don't even need ESG, because without the securing the gains, they lose. But you, the user, always have control over your platforms, your home, your business, your community. So the models are there, the money is there, the market is speaking, and I'm hoping that everyone in this room go back to your digital communities and tomorrow morning help move this forward. We've got to hope that we have enough time to lay this out, and last thought about timing, because you young people and want to know, can this happen? We laid out the whole first industrial revolution in the United States from 1860 to 1890. It only took 30 years. We laid out an entire electricity grid across that country, a telegraph system. We laid out an entire railroad system across the continent. We ceded millions of acres of land to homesteaders for their habitats. We laid out public universities the first time in the world to train the workforce. We did the second industrial revolution in 25 years, from 1908 to 1932, in the urban areas, not the rural. We electrified every urban area in 25 years in the U.S. We put in telephone systems in every urban area. We put out millions of vehicles. We put in the road systems in 25 years. So do not tell me we cannot do this in 20 years with a digital smart revolution. This can be done in 20 years. So we have no excuse but to either say, it's too late, I'm tired, or I want to go back to my comfortable day-to-day -day life. You have to be our model. You have to be our trailblazers. You're going to have to be our pioneers. You're going to have to rethink how we put this third industrial revolution infrastructure in practice in each region you work. Tomorrow morning, thank you.